At the epicenter again. COVID cases reach an all-time high in Germany and parts of Eastern Europe as the WHO warns the continent could be headed for a deadly winter. I'm Andrea Sankey and today's newsmaker is Europe's coronavirus resurgence. It's been almost two years since the coronavirus first emerged in China. Today, COVID-19 has killed more than 5 million people worldwide. And with cases rising in Europe, the continent could be heading for a devastating few months. By February, the WHO fears another 500,000 Europeans could lose their lives to COVID-19. Hospitalization admission rates due to COVID-19 more than doubled in one week based on WHO Europe's latest data. According to one reliable projection, if we stay on this trajectory, we could see another half a million COVID-19 deaths in Europe and Central Asia by the 1st of February next year. Across the continent, hospitals are battling the deadly Delta variant. Russia has been setting new records for COVID deaths on a daily basis with almost 1,200 people dying every single day. And Western Europe is struggling too. On Thursday, cases hit an all-time high in Germany with nearly 34,000 new infections. Now that record came one day after Health Minister Jens Spahn called for stricter measures for the unvaccinated. We see in countries like Italy, I myself have experienced that at the G20 meeting in Rome, that I've been checked for my vaccination certificate more often there on one day than in Germany in four weeks sometimes. And I think more needs to be done here. That's why I would like to make an explicit appeal. Spahn went on to warn that Germany is facing a massive pandemic of the unvaccinated. And the fact that the number of shots being administered has slowed in recent months across Europe is a huge concern. In Spain, about 80% of the country is fully vaccinated. In Germany, just over two thirds. The UK is about the same at 67% but cross into Eastern Europe and the numbers are significantly lower. Russia has only vaccinated about 37% of its population. Romania, just one in three, and only 22% of Bulgaria's population is fully vaccinated. Well, Romania and Bulgaria have the lowest vaccination rates in the European Union. This week, both reported their highest single day death tolls since the start of the pandemic. 310 in Bulgaria and 591 in Romania. Vaccines are readily available across Eastern Europe, but millions remain reluctant. The WHO has continued to stress the importance of getting the shots, but it's also concerned that Europe is neglecting other public health measures. And, and that's where we really need to come back to the forgotten child of the pandemic response, which is the public health measures, the contact tracing, the testing, the isolation. And, and I think we, we tend to get so focused on the vaccine uptake that, um, that we do forget that in these current contexts, regardless of the reasons for low vaccine uptake, we still need to put a lot of attention on those other components of the response. Now, vaccines aren't the only tool we have in the fight against coronavirus. Oral antivirals are also in development, with one slated to hit the UK market this month. Just a few days ago, British health authorities approved Molnupiravir, the first pill to treat those who've contracted COVID-19. It can be taken at home by vulnerable patients as soon as they test positive, and studies show it can dramatically reduce the risk of hospitalization and death. Some are calling it a game changer. And on Friday, Pfizer announced clinical trials showed its Paxlovid antiviral cut the risk of hospitalization and death by almost 90%. But even with effective vaccines and promising antiviral treatments, health authorities are warning, beware of the winter ahead. Here to discuss why and to debate what needs to be done is Dr. Annelise Wilder-Smith, a professor of emerging infectious diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a consultant to the World Health Organization. Dr. Bharat Pankania is a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School and Dr. Lawrence Young is a professor of molecular oncology at Warwick Medical School. Thanks all so much uh, for being with us. You know, it is exhausting because we are halfway through year two 
of this pandemic, and uh, we're now hearing about an even worse winter to potentially come. Dr. Pankania, in Europe, is most of that down to vaccine hesitance? No, not at all. Um, the uptake of vaccines in Europe could be better. It is 75% or thereabouts total uh, two vaccines. Nevertheless, this is clear. This is clear science. The more you interact with human beings, the greater your chances of picking up an infection. So we have a perfect storm of several things happening. One, the vaccines, which were started seven, eight months ago, uh, some of the immunity is dropping. Secondly, the wearing of masks is also dropping. Thirdly, the hesitancy from certain rulers in certain of the European nations to emphasize infection control, protective, preventative measures. And finally, the last bit that also works very well and helps is wearing a mask, wearing a good quality FFP2 type mask, wearing it properly. And then, of course, now we've got the arrival of influenza as well. So mm. it's a number of items all playing its part. Yeah, I'd like to talk about the influenza issue uh, a little bit further on. But Adelise Wilder-Smith, um, we know that people have gotten a bit complacent about wearing masks and social distancing. Uh, and, but going into this season, to see particularly countries in Eastern Europe and Russia with such low vaccination rates, um, focus on that for one second and tell us how detrimental it's been uh, to the wider problem. So indeed, within Europe, there are huge variations in vaccine coverage rates. In in the in in Russia, it's below. It's around forty percent. Uh, in uh, Switzerland, it's around sixty percent. Germany, about sixty-eight percent. The UK has had more success, has higher vaccine coverage. Portugal has very high. Denmark has very high. So the higher your vaccine coverage, the lower the number of deaths that you will expect. I think that's very important. These vaccines are very good in preventing deaths and severe COVID. They are, they are less good in preventing mild infections. So we may still mild infections, but that doesn't matter. What we want to see is we want to prevent deaths. And for mm. that, these vaccines are still highly, highly successful, even with the Delta variant. Right. Dr. Young, what are your fears, though, now? I mean, how bad could this winter really be? Uh, how worried are you exactly? Well, I think very worried, given the levels of infection and the pressures that's putting on the various health uh, structures ac across Europe. And as we've just mentioned, it's a perfect storm, really, of less, less mask wearing, more mixing indoors. The weather isn't great. And we know that as the weather deteriorates and gets colder, People are going to spend more time indoors in poorly ventilated spaces, and that's going to increase trans transmission. And we've also got waning immunity, even though in those countries like the UK, where we started off very successfully with the vaccine program, we're now in a situation where the elderly and vulnerable have waning immune responses and need booster jabs. And then we've got superimposed on that, of course, flu and other respiratory virus infections during what will be an extremely challenging winter for, um, I think, for all the sort of health service structures across Europe. Dr. Young, then what about the booster jabs? I mean, how crucial are they then in at least protecting the most vulnerable going into this winter? It, they're extremely effective. We can see data, real world data from Israel, which demonstrates how important booster jabs are and how rapidly that jab can result in a significant reduction, not only in levels of infection, but also in hospitalizations. And that's why I think getting on with booster jabs is quite important. But of course, we're in a difficult situation where many countries across Europe haven't even got their population fully vaccinated yet, let alone what you can consider to be the luxury of booster jabs. Right. But, I, you know, it's an interesting conundrum. And Dr. Annalise uh, Wilder-Smith, we've talked about this at several points. Um, you know, it's the people that are privileged enough to have access to the vaccines that are demonstrating the most vaccine reluctance. But now that we are at the point of what could be a devastating winter flu and coronavirus season ahead, would you now agree that booster jabs are crucial at this point? Crucial at this point is to continue vaccinating the unvaccinated. So the first dose must be given into many more arms. That's the 
priority number one. Priority number two is indeed for the very vulnerable, that means the very old, extreme old, those with underlying um, other medical problems where we know that put them at higher risk of severe COVID, they, they will benefit from a third dose, from a booster dose. But the message is really, if we want to tackle this, this outbreak, if you really want to have a better winter this year compared to last year, we need to vaccinate the unvaccinated. Right. This epidemic yes. is driven by the unvaccinated. Interesting. Dr. Uh, Pancania, you know, we heard the German health minister comparing Germany uh, to Italy. So has the Italian approach, you know, made a tangible difference? And, and if so, why hasn't it been rolled out Europe-wide? Well, this is a clear example of uh, we are not working in a uh, integrated international manner. And as my colleague, um, the, Professor Annelies Wilder-Smith said, vaccines prevent you from dying. And yet here in some countries, we're busy giving away third doses to groups of people who don't necessarily need it. We need to get the vaccines into arms uh, in people who have not had any vaccines. And I really mean internationally, because in Europe, uh, what happens in Euro in Africa will happen in Europe. What happens in Europe will happen in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. So really, we need a integrated approach to immunizing universally. Okay. Uh, Dr. Young, when we, you know, we've been talking or mentioning very often the risk of actually new variants. But we've also heard that at this point, they should actually be weakening uh, because we're not just getting vaccinated, we're also building herd immunity. Is that one upside to the point we're at now in this one and a half years of, of pandemic uh, situation? I'm not, I'm not so sure about the herd immunity issue. With the Delta variant being so transmissible, it's difficult to, 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 to achieve herd immunity. One of the big concerns that I don't think we're hearing enough about is that the, as the virus continues to spread, even in a partially immune vaccinated population, you will throw up other variants. And the biggest fear of yes. all around the world and why we do need those jabs in arms across the world is that we could be facing other the, the generation of other variants. We've seen the impact of Delta and how that's changed the game considerably. There's a new sub-variant of Delta that we're looking at at the moment, AY.4.2, which is probably about 10% more transmissible than Delta. Not sure that that's anything to worry about just mm. yet. But what we're not hearing enough about is the fact that one of the big risks in not getting people vaccinated is that as the virus continues to spread, even in individuals who have mild or uh, who are asymptomatic, it will continue to change and it will continue to be selected. Okay. Um, and, that's, and that, at the moment, I think, should still be a concern. Transmissibility is one thing, though, Dr. Young, but the, the other is the strength of the variant itself. And I have read several scientific studies that have said that as the virus continues to go up against the vaccine with the incrementally building kind of herd immunity, the variants do weaken. Um, are you saying that we still actually might have the potential for an even stronger, more destructive, dangerous variant coming out? We just don't know. The whole idea of a weakened virus is something we, we, we sort of hope for because we compare this with other types of virus and indeed other previous coronavirus infections. And one of the ideas here is as the viral virus becomes more transmissible, it may become less disease causing, less pathogenic. There's no evidence for that at the moment because okay. we're still in the throes of a pandemic. And the biggest single concern is that uh, a variant that's more immune evasive could that's... be thrown up okay. in a, in a in a, in a population that's not fully protected. That's distressing. Um, Bharat Pankani, I'll come back to you because you brought up the, uh, the other issue with the influenza virus, you know, coming online as, as uh, northern latitudes go into the winter season. Uh, and one of the even bigger problems with the influenza virus is that it also does affect children uh, terribly. What, what might we be up against? Well, the bigger concern that I have with the seasonal influenza this year is the strain in circulation in Croatia, H3N2. Now, that particular strain against which we do have uh, the seasonal influenza vaccine, which is being given this year, unfortunately, older people don't make good immunity against H3N2. Mm -hmm. So the issue is we need to suppress influenza 
globally. We need to in, in, suppress it in all age groups. Therefore, I'm very concerned about the UK, where our school's immunization program has not picked up pace. And if you start generating a lot of cases in the school population, eventually, and very quickly, it's not a slow run, it's a very quick run, it goes up the age groups. And then when you expose the older age groups who may be immunized, but not fully immunized, immune, sorry, who may be immunized, but not fully immune, then we will start getting cases of influenza in the immune people, immunized people. And then we may also get pressures on the hospitals. Okay. Uh, Dr. Wildersmith, I'll come back to you and ask a practical question, because if we are up against the coronavirus, COVID-19, as well as a dangerous influenza season, how do you recommend people prepare for the holiday season? Should they be thinking about socially distancing again and perhaps not planning these big holiday family get-togethers? We really want to, to lead normal lives again. Uh, so if we do it with some creativity, uh, I think we can still have a very happy Christmas. To me, that means we limit our family gatherings uh, we ensure that we have encouraged all our family members to be vaccinated if they haven't been. And, and if you really don't want to be vaccinated and some family members just don't want to be uh, vaccinated, maybe ask for an antigen test before you then have your family celebrations. As for travel, um, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I would limit a travel still, although I have now traveled this in the last few months and it is getting easier to travel, but I, you know, tr try, try, you know, enjoy your Christmas in your home uh, with a smaller family gathering, maybe as as usual, um, and and get vaccinated. Right, uh, Dr. Smith, if I can uh, stick with you for a second, because I do want to look um, at Russia, where we're seeing just the most dramatic numbers uh, that we've really seen uh, throughout the course of that, this pandemic. Specifically in Russia, they're recording record numbers of deaths and hospitalization. Worst case scenario. Can you talk to us about the, yes, there's, there's vaccine hesitation we know in Russia, but what about the vaccines that are actually available there? Is there a problem, perhaps, with the Sputnik vaccine and what is on offer in certain markets, Russia and others that have been uh, distributed to, with the actual vaccine they're using not being as effective? The question is to whom? It's to you. Go ahead. <laughs> um, a, a Sputnik um, was designed to be an adenoviral vector vaccine, which is a similar, a similar platform as to the AstraZeneca vaccine. And I see no reason why it should not work. I do think it works. That said, uh, the WHO has not yet um, looked at this vaccine in more detail for various reasons. Um, and, and so I, I'm also not fully aware of the, all the details of this vaccine. But by in theory, this vaccine should work. It is the problem in Russia is that the vaccine has not been taken up in the amount that we really would want to see. And now with the winter and the high population density of Russian cities, it is now coming back with a vengeance. And really, you know, use Sputnik, use the vaccines that are available to you. Make sure you, you achieve at least 70% coverage in your population. Okay. Bharat Pankani or uh, Lawrence Young, did, did you have any specific information about the, the Sputnik vaccine uh, and its, its efficacy? So, Go ahead, Dr. Pankani. I, I totally agree with my colleague, uh, Professor Annelise. Um, it isn't that the Sputnik vaccine, which as was clearly mentioned, it's a adenovirus uh, platform. Um, human adenovirus compared to a chimpanzee adenovirus for the AstraZeneca. So it's same, same. It should work. The problem in the Russian Russia is hesitancy. Uh, the population uh, don't trust uh, their government or whatever, and that's why there is that hesitancy. And what is required is a good messaging, a good communication that these vaccines work, and more importantly, they will save your life. They will prevent you from getting severe illness and dying. That is a important okay. message to put out. Okay.
Dr. Lawrence Young, let's move on to what we could consider the, the better news <laughs> that actually was just, uh, just out on Friday. Um, this treatment for, for COVID-19 now, molnupiravir, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, it's now due out in a couple of weeks in the UK market, and Pfizer has also just announced you know, that one of its trials uh, showed that it was, has an antiviral that's 89% effective in preventing hospitalization and death. Could these, could these be the game changers? Well, the game changers in the sense that they give us another option, a very important option in terms of uh, treating infection, particularly early infection, where these drugs are most effective as uh, agents that will block virus replication. And of course, this is something really important, particularly for the most vulnerable, for individuals who don't mount a strong response to vaccination. The key here is finding uh, in, you know, individuals at the early stage of infection. Um, and I think what we're facing now is hopefully a range of new antiviral drugs that could be used in different settings. So I think this is very, very exciting. But the thing to say is these will never, ever replace vaccines and the efficacy of vaccines. So whilst the trials of these drugs look very exciting and they certainly do reduce virus replication, they certainly do reduce the risk of hospitalization, they will never replace the, the benefit, the widespread benefit of vaccination. Maybe not, but Bharat uh, Pankania, talk about the mentality, if you will, of, of people, you know, who fear or don't trust the vaccine, but once they're sick, you know, they're willing to try whatever is on the market, even medications developed for, for animals, like Invermectin. Uh, they'll throw the kitchen sink at it. So maybe antivirals in that sense are, are even the, the better bet for beating COVID-19 deaths. No, 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 not at all. And we must never mix up our messages. Prevention is better. Prevention by vaccines I understand it's better, but life. you're still going to have those people that will not be convinced. They're just not gonna buy into it. They're taking a risk. It's uh, the, like, the, the new pills, the new antivirals work. They work best in early infection, in mild infection and only if taken early. So there are lots of risks in sitting there saying to yourself, ah, there's an antiviral, I'll take it. It may not work. It only works in early cases and you're taking a big risk. It's better to be protected, better to be immunized. Okay, uh, Dr. Vildersmith, are, are you on the same page or do you, I mean, for those that just, it's a reality we have to face. All of you have made the same argument that the, the vaccines are the best way, simply the best way. But we know with humanity, especially in what we've seen over the last couple of years, what we are up against. Uh, so Dr. Vilder Smith, I'll, you know, I'll finish with you. How much, how important are getting these now antivirals to the market for those that are going to just simply refuse the vaccinations? It's an important additional tool, yeah. not a tool that we can, can replace vaccines. Remember, vaccines bring down the number of cases. Uh, with drugs, you just treat cases. So your hospital systems may still be overwhelmed. A vaccine protects against about 80 to 90% of all infections. This drug only works in 50% when you have the infection. So, so there are total differences. We need, we need a package of tools. And drugs is one tool, masks is another tool, social distancing. But vaccines is the most effective, also cost-effective and safest tool to get us out of, this, out of this tragic pandemic as fast as possible. As fast as possible. Then, Bharat Pankani, I'll finish with you. I mean, what is as fast as possible? Do you think this could potentially be our last season, <laughs> given that the vaccines are on the market, given that antivirals are now on the market? Will this be our last challenge up against COVID-19, the winter of 21-22? No, is my short, un uh, unfortunate answer. Um, the, the correct, precise answer is we don't know. But what we ought to be doing is not be relaxed about making pharmaceuticals and new vaccines. And most important, because prevention always works, is now energize ourselves to prevent the emergence of new novel viruses. Because if we don't energize ourselves to do that, new ones from somewhere, some other place will keep on appearing. Lawrence Young, do you think the lessons at least for beating a pandemic have been learned thus far? 
I don't know. I sincerely hope so. Um, and we really do need to learn lessons for the future. We need to think about how we're prepared in terms of uh, antiviral drugs and vaccines. And the, you know, we are learning a lot, certainly a lot about coronaviruses and there are lots of exciting new developments, including the possibility of developing a vaccine that could be protective against all coronaviruses, whether known or unknown. So one of the, dare I say, small silver linings to all of this is a renewed interest in developing new approaches to treating viruses and to preventing viruses spreading from animals into humans. Doctors Lawrence Young, Annalise Wilder-Smith and Bharat Pankania, thank you all so much uh, for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers. Greatly appreciated. And thanks, of course, to our viewers for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at the underscore Newsmakers and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.